in the Zoom. <laughs> Got it. That um, that it's interesting kind of managing a hybrid here when we have people in person, we have to speak into the microphone or you folks in the Zoom can't hear. Um, so we'll try to, Darlene will try to repeat the questions. She has a couple of spots where she'll stop here for questions. Um, and we'll, if you in the Zoom room have questions or issues in the chat, you can just uh, put them into the chat and eventually I'll get over to my computer and I'll bring up the questions for Darlene. So that's kind of the, the how we're gonna work this, this class this evening. And with that, I wanted to start with our, our introduction. So welcome, welcome those of you that are here to the SOREC. Are there people in the room that have never been here before? Yay, I'm always so delighted to see that, welcome. We have all kinds of programs going on here. Um, hopefully you're on our email list, at least the Land Steward program, that's my program. We have an email list and that's where we advertise our classes that we uh, put together with the help of a volunteer committee. Uh, if you have ideas, if you have instructors or topics that you would like us to bring in, we're happy to, to try to do that for you. We love, love providing classes like this. Um, our next class after this one is, called, is Heirloom Apples by Dr. Deborah Schaefer, and that is, I think, October 11th. And then further out in November, we have a couple on propagating native plants and then one more generally about propagating plants. I think those two are in November. So get on our email list if you're not already. I'm Rachel Whirling. I'm the coordinator for the Land Steward Program. And I'm here to introduce our wonderful instructor, Darlene Southworth, who is a retired professor from SOU and a member of the Native Plant Society. <laughs> and I'll let, I'll let you finish up with your introduction here. But hopefully we okay. have things. Just take that on ring. Right. So let us know if you can't hear us in the Zoom or if you can't hear Darlene and we'll work on the volume and those kinds of issues, we'll get things going here. Okay. All right, so let's test, how am I, how's my voice? Can you hear me? Sort of yes. okay, you know, yell if you can't. And do we have any way of telling whether the Zoom people can yeah, hear? Yeah, you ask them, they should, they say Zoom people, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, all right. Um, my background is in botany. I have a bachelor's and master's in botany from the University of Michigan and a PhD in botany from the University of California, Berkeley. And my first work, my work for about 45 years, concerned pollen development, which is in no wise the topic of today. And um, in 1998, a colleague at UC Davis uh, called me and she said, well, we're, we're going to apply for an NSF grant. We're going to study mycorrhizal fungi on, well, something. Mm -hmm. And um, did I want to join them? And, and I like to support my friends. So I say, sure. I didn't think we'd ever get the money. I thought it was like I could be really nice to my friend and I wouldn't have to do anything. Well, that turned out not to be the case. We actually got the money and there were six PIs. There were people from University of California, Davis, one from Riverside and me and SOU. And what I brought to the group was a knowledge of microscopy, how to do, how to take pictures through the microscope. And I brought a lot of undergraduate students. So much of this work was actually done by undergraduate students. I don't know, 30 or 50 of them over a period of 10 years. And uh, we began work in 1999. I worked on this for about 20 years and a couple of years ago have really truly retired. So that's it. When we got this money, I said to the students in the lab that day, I think we better go have a look. And this is what we went out to have a look. And this site um, on this slide is at Whetstone Savannah. At that time, it was owned by the Nature Conservancy. It's now managed by Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. It's in the Rogue River Plain below the Table Rocks. It's not on the shoulders of the table rocks, but it's it's in the in the floodplain uh, where there are vernal pools. So that's where we are. And I, I'm really interested in how we think we know what we know. I, I didn't write that on there. I'd like sort of how, how do we really think about knowing? This will be a very short slide. So much of my knowing what I know today will be direct observation and experience. So that's as good as I can do it. Maybe some of that's wrong. Maybe it's inadequate. Maybe it changes. But that's most of what I will tell you about is work that we've actually done, things that I've held in my hands and I've looked at. And other people's work, the people that we worked with on this team, um, we worked on five oak species. 
and I know their work well. And beyond that, there's um, literature on it. There's logical implications of things and hypotheses. Hypotheses is it's a big word. It just means a good guess based on something. Um, and then there are wild guesses. Sometimes those are called wags. I will be polite. And um, some things that we just have no idea. And it might be possible to know them, but they're either hard to get at, like how deep is the taproot on an oak? That would be something I was like, okay, I don't know because I've never been down there. And you could theoretically do it, but you probably kill the tree and that's not a good idea. So you see the problems. Anyway, I will start with my, uh, try to tell you where I am on this scale, whether I'm making a wild guess, whether it's a reasonable inference or whether I've actually seen this. Okay, this story is about oaks really, and they're called ectomycorrhizal trees. I'll come to those definitions here in a minute. Um, my work was all on Quercus Gariana, Oregon white oak, also known as Gary Oak in Canada. And the others, others in my research group worked on two species in the valley, valley oak and blue oak, and some species in Southern California. I forget which species. This work also applies to other genera, pines in the Pinaceae, in the pine family, um, pines, fir, spruce, Douglas fir, not uh, cedars, we'll come to that in a minute, not junipers, not redwoods. Anyway, pine family, pine, fir, spruce, Douglas fir, those are the most, most common ones in there. Eucalypts, it also applies to, uh, which are um, both in this continent by virtue of travel. And in Australia, lots of Australians working on this, birch, some woody rosaceae, we've actually done some work on mountain mahogany, which is pretty interesting, and on madrone. So a lot of our sites had white oak, madrone, and ponderosa pine. Those are the big three that live together all over this part of the, of the state. These, the situation in redwoods, junipers, cedars, I didn't write that on there, maples, elms, walnuts, it's a different story and, and I'd be happy to talk about it, but we'd be here till midnight. So we, we will save that for another time. And I haven't worked on those so directly myself. So we're really talking oaks, but it, it's similar things are found in oak relatives like beech. There's even um, a beech relative in, in Chile. So it's, it's it's a widespread phenomenon, global phenomenon. As far as we know, not Mars, not the moon. Okay, <clears throat> and the fungi. So who are the fungi? Most of our uh, work has been done. Most of the mycorrhizas that I talk about are either basidiomycetes, now called officially basidiomycota. These include mushrooms and truffles, conchs, things that, uh, shelf fungi, and crusts, things that you kind of don't pay much attention to, but that live on uh, downed logs and downed wood. Also, the ascomycetes, officially called ascomycota, which include cup fungi, those little orange things that come on a burn pile, uh, a burned charred area, truffles, uh, and morels. You notice that truffles got in both because there are basidiomycete truffles and ascomycete truffles, so yes. Another group that's in there are called the glomeromycota. You never see them, so never mind. And there's other mycota, likewise. Okay. Um, the fungi are heterotrophs. We'll come back to this, this word. Well, actually, I don't think I put this word on the slide. Heterotroph, other eating. And it's like us, you know, we eat other stuff. We're not photosynthetic, we're not green. So if you were photosynthetic and you made your own food, you'd be called autotrophic. That's the trees, the grasses, the green stuff. And fungi are all heterotrophic. Nobody in the kingdom fungi would dream of doing photosynthesis because you can get somebody else to do that for you. So they're heterotrophs like us. And genetically, fungi are more similar to animals than they are to plants, though when I took um, botany in 1959 at the University of Michigan, fungi were taught with botany. We were taught a part of botany. They have a stalk, you know, it, it sort of sticks up out of the ground, like maybe it could be a stem and, um, and they don't move and they don't have eyes and backbones. 
And so they seemed more like plants, but by feeding in their, in their method of feeding, they're more like animals and genetically more like animals. So we're looking at two kingdoms here. The plants are photosynthetic, they're autotrophic, and the fungi who are heterotrophs, just like us. How about that? Okay. And here's their eating habits. So the, the fungi are all eating something else that's made by a plant, like us. Some of them eat dead stuff. They're called saprotrophic, and that's this word. Okay, look at that little cute red circle. Saprotrophic, and these are really responsible for cleaning up the world, just like yellow jackets and turkey vultures clean up the world and the ants clean up the world. These, these plants eat oaks. So let's talk about oaks, um, uh, Oregon white oaks. The leaves fall every fall. And our, in our experience, two years later, those leaves are all gone. They've all turned to crumbs and they've all been, well, where did they go? They just got eaten by fungi and also by bacteria and other organisms. So there's a lot of fungi, mushrooms that you see, mushrooms in your lawn, including mushrooms under trees are saprotrophs and they're not the subject of mycorrhizal conversations. Um, they're, they're not directly attached to a tree and they're called, so it seems like there's no direct relation. That is, they're not hanging on to the branch or in the leaf or anything like that, but they're part of what cycles nutrients. So they're really important to trees. There are some fungi who are pathog pathogenic and cause disease. Um, there's some conchs, some shelf fungi on oaks that cause disease. And we'll come back to sudden oak death here in a minute. Um, and then we come to the third group, which are mycorrhizal. And these hang on, they are intimately attached to roots. And they are mutualistic, they share. They're getting something from the plant and they're giving something in return. And they're beneficial, so that's a good thing. And it's obligate, and that's an important word. And what it means is that the trees don't live without them and they don't live without the trees. Fair enough, okay, you know, that's what obligate means. So this means that you're not gonna be culturing oaks without fungi for very long. They have big seeds. I mean, I know about acorns and there's a lot of food in the acorns. So they'll live for a while. They won't live forever. They won't live like 10 years. And the fungi are really difficult to culture. Can you culture fungi, any fungi? Sure, but the ones that are cultured are saprotrophs. You can feed them any kind of dead plant material, um, whatever they prefer, whatever works, uh, but it doesn't have to be alive. In fact, it's better if it's not alive for them. So saprotrophs you can grow in culture. Mycorrhizas, mycorrhizal fungi really cannot be grown in culture. You know, there might be an exception, somebody who's got little roots in there is working around. They're not easily cultured, uh, not commercially cultured like that. Okay, and now the combination, the, the mycorrhiza. So the word itself means fungus root, the myco and the rhiza, the fungus and the root. And I'm gonna be talking about a group that are called ectomycorrhizas. And ecto of course means around on the outside. And these are found, these fungi would be basidiomycota or ascomycota, whereas the vesicular or muscular mycorrhizas the ones that are in redwoods and maples and cedars and junipers are an entirely different group with a different structure. And I'm not gonna do those today. All right, sudden oak death. It's on everybody's mind around here. As far as I know, mycorrhizas do not protect against sudden oak death. It would really be a hard experiment to set up because all of the oaks that I have ever seen the roots of, which isn't all the oaks, um, say, Oregon, California, lots of oaks. They all have mycorrhizal, mycorrhizas on their roots. They all do, all the roots do. Well, all the roots in the upper layers. And um, so you could say, well, what if we had an oak and we took away all the mycorrhizas and then we tried to see if sudden oak death would attack it? Well, we really can't do that experiment because you won't, there won't be any such oaks. You can't do them. I mean, they're not there, so it's hard. Um, 
So as far as I know, they don't offer any protection against sudden oak death, but there are genetic forms of resistance. And Oregon white oak, fortuitously, is resistant to sudden oak death. So it doesn't get attacked by the Phytophthora. Um, good for it, huh? Black oak gets it, tan oak gets it. Tan oak's not quercus, but it's, it's in that group. Okay, and this is the mutualistic symbiosis, the exchange here. The fungi get carbohydrates. That's probably the primary thing they get from the tree. They get sugars, that's the carbohydrates. Um, they get habitat, shade, cool soils. Gee, it's great down there where the oak roots are. They really like it. Everybody's happy. And they get water from deep sources. It turns out that oaks do have deep roots, as I said before. I don't know how far down they go because I haven't been there. I haven't dug up roots. I, I, I'm opposed to that. But they're not falling over. You know, a shallow-rooted tree goes when the, when the wind blows. Um, really when serious wind blows. The oaks rarely do that. They're remarkably, they stand up with all those big limbs and you think, my God, how do they do that? Well, they must be deeply rooted. So what people do know is that at night, the oaks, the roots are still taking up water from deep sources. And, and we know, I mean, you know, in Ashland, if you have a basement down in the valley, you will get water in it, you have to pump it out. The, the water table is pretty high here. We're not, it's not, not very far from water. So the, the deep roots from oaks get the water and at night they squish it out into the soil. I am not making this up. There are studies that show that the deep water is coming up and actually going out. So the fungi are getting some deep water. It's a pretty good deal. The oaks get surface water, which is not that. So, so that's not the deep water. The, when it rains, you get, eventually it will rain, I hope, and the surface layers say about a foot deep, about like that. We're not talking about real, real deep. We're talking like that. The fungi can take up water and transfer that to the tree. Also, the fungi take up nutrients. The nutrients that are broken down by the saprotrophic fungi can be taken up by the mycorrhizal fungi and transferred to the tree. Uh, nitrogen is probably the biggest one and uh, phosphorus in, in some conditions and other things. It, in order to say, is nitrogen taken up by the fungus and transferred to the tree? You have to have a way to tell that it is. So people label the nitrogen. And in the olden days, we used uh, radioactive tracers. Now you can use stable isotopes of nitrogen and you can measure them in a mass spectrometer because they're a little bit heavier than than normal nitrogen, and you can tell what's going in. But you have to ask the question, you're like, well, do they take up uh, selenium? Well, you'd have to figure out a way to label selenium, and then you'd have to see whether that went into the tree. So these experiments are doable, but non-trivial. So we don't know exactly what nutrients go in. They appear to protect from soil pathogens. They promote tolerance to drought. We were driving up here looking on the interstate, the grasslands are completely yellow ochre. The oaks are all green, you know? Somebody knows something. And they promote soil structure. That would be, you know, lumps. Sometimes they make the soil make little lumps so it's not just fine silt that gets washed away. And sometimes they make cavities in the soil. Okay, um, before we come to this one, let's see if there are any questions about definitions about the trees, the fungus, what they do. Anybody in the room want to ask anything? Anything coming in? Okay, we'll proceed. So how do you know? How do we know these things? How do we go about this? And definitely you have to go out in the field and get down and dirty. You have to go below ground. You don't have to go caving. A lot of our work was done with soil cores. These are, you can see the size of a person's hand. Um, it's uh, like a one inch soil core, press it into the ground. Students got very good at kind of leaping onto it and pull it out and it comes out. And I think of it as a kind of biopsy. It's like when somebody punches some part of you, you don't wanna think about this too much and they, they take it away and they go analyze it and you grow back, you know, don't you? And um, 
that's the way I think about it. So these are kind of biopsies of the soil root zone there. We would get those back in the lab and wash the roots out of soil. This is a, a geological sieve. We'd end up with a bunch of uh, rootish stuff and organic matter in a white pan. And we'd sit there in the afternoon and pick out roots with a forceps. It was very relaxing, very, very good work. And then look at them in the microscope. This is a dissecting microscope. It had a camera on it and it could be pulled up on a computer so we can get digital images. And this is what we would see. Let's go here. Things that looked like this. And if you get to know roots, I mean, if you look at enough roots, like probably tens of thousands of roots, these roots appear a little thick and a little blunt and they don't have little root hairs on them. If you, if you're looking at a really a naked root, it would be pointier, thicker, it wouldn't have all these branches and it would have root hairs, which are, are visible in the microscope. So we learned to recognize what was a mycorrhizal root. And here you see a tan one. Sometimes they're black with dark brown with gray tips and different kinds of branching patterns. And uh, this one's probably tuber. Um, just characteristic, and in the in the early part of our work, like around 2000, we were actually attempting to describe these things, colors, cell shape, and to be able to identify them that way. There was a large European group that was working on that. It was a nightmare. This one is very common. It's uh, an ascomycete. It's very shiny black and it has all these black hyphae. The black hyphae are very stiff and they seem to preserve very well. So we see a lot of those like that. But hyphae are a part of the mycorrhizal fungus. So if you look at this, say you take a little shaving off that, a little shaving off that to see the cells, what you see is this, that there is a mantle around the root. So let's look, let's consider this mantle. These are little boxy cells, not very fungal looking cells. Most fungal cells are long and skinny like hyphae, but these are, are boxy um, like other plant cells, but these are not plant cells. So there's a mantle of fungus around the root tip of virtually every oak root tip in the upper layers. And then just inside that, Let's see if I can get this right. Is this layer that's called the Hartic net, named for somebody whose last name was Hartic. So each of these cells, like that, is an epidermal cell. And see all this squiggly stuff, really skinny things in there? How are we doing in the back of the room? Can we see this? Okay. Those are a mass of skinny hyphae around the cell of the epidermis. So the fungus comes up to the root and it forms a layer around it and it goes into the, in between the epidermal cells. So it's, it's still on the surface. It's not inside the cells, it's around them. Beats all how all this gets figured out. And in here aren't any. So in the cortex of the root, in the xylem and phloem and all the way up the trunk, no fungi. How on earth does that work? I have no idea. That's in the no idea category. I couldn't even come up with a good guess. So that's the nature of a mycorrhiza. The mycorrhiza is the fungus root. It's a root, it's a genuine root inside it with cortex and xylem and phloem. The xylem's for water, the phloem's for sugars. And around that root is a mantle of a fungus and it has little skinny cells that invest the epidermal cells. And that's where things get exchanged in that heart net around there. The, and, and with this mantle, let's just go back once. See this completely protective, see it coats the whole thing. So we can understand why that might offer some protection against parasites or pathogens or somebody who's in there causing trouble. Um, and these kind of hyphae are part of the, the ability of the tree to pick up nutrients and water. The hyphae are much skinnier than the skinniest root. So the skinniest root 
it's like skinnier than a pencil lead. And the hyphae are more like the diameter of a blood cell, just in case you've seen blood cells. Um, it's more like seven microns instead of 100 or 500 or something like that. So it, it, the, the fungal hyphae can get into little cavities in the soil. They can burrow in there and reach more water and more nutrients than the roots can. So that's really what the mycorrhiza is. Okay, that was the mantle and the hartignet. Okay, so identifying them. So we need to know who these fungi are. And um, really, since we began this study in 1998, 99, the, the methods, just the tech skills just flew, that just exploded. And um, I think 1993 was the publication of the first paper using DNA methods to identify fungi. So always you're comparing the DNA on the roots, the DNA of the fungus on the roots, with the DNA of a known fungus, some mushroom that you could pick up and identify by the usual methods, morphological methods. So to, to tell, to identify the fungi on the roots, to identify the mycorrhizal fungi, this is what we did. The protocols were available. We did not invent this method. Um, it's widely used. Everybody who studies mycorrhizas does this. Extract the DNA is a series of steps. Copy short pieces of the fungal DNA. We're not doing whole genome sequencing. We're just doing maybe 200 to 800 base pairs. Uh, we sequence those and compare them to the sequence of known fungi. And there's a um, National Center for Biological Information called, the database is called GenBank. And we would uh, sit in our labs at SOU and click on to GenBank and see what was, compare them. It was phenomenal. We got the sequencer about two years after we started the project. A group of us um, wrote a, a combined grant for small institutions and collaborative research to get a sequencer. We got it on the first try beyond deserving. This is the sequencer. This is David Taylor, one of the students. He's pipetting. Yeah, you can see the pipette. There's an ice bucket. I mean, Students can do this. They learn how to read the procedure and they do it. It's a, it's a protocol that's written down. So it's not like something you have to invent. It's something you can engage with and you compare to known fungi in GenBank. Are all the fungi in GenBank? Of course not. So sometimes you come up with one that isn't in GenBank and um, that's been really fun too, but maybe we'll have time to talk about that. Okay, and what we found was that the oaks at Whetstone Savannah form mycorrhizas with over 30 species of fungi. So these are basidios, ascos, some of those are crusts, some of those are mushrooms, some of those are truffles, those are the biggest ones. Um, and they're all mycorrhizal and they're all obligates. So some of them you would know about, boletes, for example, if you, if you are a mushroom hunter and you collect boletes, king boletes, boletes are all obligately mycorrhizal. Um, and many of our fungi turned out to be truffles, that is hypogeous fungi that grow below ground, fruit, uh, produce their fruiting bodies below ground. It's part of the story here. Okay, so we picked the fungi, picked the roots out of the ground, put them, extracted DNA from them, copied pieces of fungal DNA and compared them to sequences in a national database. And we could tell you the name of the fungus. Pretty good, huh? Okay, and these were the kind of the take home lessons at this point. Every root tip of Oregon white oak in the upper 25 centimeters of soil is mycorrhizal, except the new growth. So every spring, the, the surface roots go out, start growing again, and they have to get their fungi. So there's actually a time when the root kind of pushes through the existing maybe old last year's mycorrhiza and grows out and it has to it has to get more fungi. By that time, the ground is full of these fungi. The hyphae are there, the spores are there, and it's not that hard to get to. So they, they keep re-inoculating them. And I did put this on there, but the, the tree doesn't carry the fungus. 
It doesn't have it on it, in it, except for the roots where, where the mycorrhizas are. Okay, these are obligate. I stress this. Um, they have to find each other. The fungus can't go very long without that. The tree can't go very long without finding the fungus. And uh, that's pretty vague, huh? Not very long, you know. Well, these things are really hard to get at, these kind of numbers. And the development of these is below ground. As soon as you get in there and take them out, they stop doing what they're doing. So it's a trick to get to that sort of thing. And there's very little information about how long all of these things take. I think the oak with an acorn might be able to live as much as two years finishing off the acorn stored food. It's not stored food in acorn. Um, I don't know that much about the fungi. The spores of a fungus aren't very big, but they may last for a while, but they sooner, if they, as soon as they grow, they have to get to the tree. Okay, they don't grow with, uh, mycorrhizal fungi do not grow without host trees. That's just sort of it. All right. Now the seasonality thing, this starts to get into a problem when you want to say, I'd like to put some mycorrhizas on this. I would like to, I would like to plant, I would like to create an oak savanna. For some reason, people like this idea. I don't know why. I mean, I love oak savannas, but I, to, to say, okay, I've got this bare land and now I would like an oak savanna. That seems just a little presumptive. And here's the problem. So I tried drawing this in a circle and it didn't circle. And I tried drawing it as a sort of a helix and it had 400 curves in it and that became impossible in PowerPoint. So here's what the deal is. The acorns are falling. They're falling right now on my garage roof and they get buried under the leaves. See, the acorns fall a little below the leaves and so then they get tucked in and um, they start germinating anywhere from November to forever, but sort of through the winter, they do. We actually did an experiment. We planted some acorns in particular places in November and you know, in February, my student comes in and says that they're not germinating. I said, yes, they are, but it's going down, it's not up. So they, they, they eventually germinate and form a, a sapling that you can see, but not right away. They form that taproot, probably, you know, these are kind of fish stories, long way down there, really, really long. And then, and that's the, that's the taproot. That's the one that's going to be big. And it's probably about like my little finger. It's like pencil thick, it's thick root. And it is not mycorrhizal. And it doesn't get that way. But in May and June, that, that taproot starts making branch roots off. So they, they come off it, little surface lateral roots in that top layer of soil. And these find the fungi. So... Um, at this time in the spring, it's like May and June, that's when you get a lot of fungi in an oak woodland in May and June, and you get a lot of truffles in there in May and June. So the inoculum, the fun fungi are available at this time when the lateral roots form. Um, how convenient, must say. Okay. All right. Let's, um, we're going to come back to some experiments. Any questions coming in at all? I have a Question. Yes. Um, I was I was wondering if some of those many fungi species partner with other vascular vascular plants. Uh, yes. Uh, good question. And the answer is yes. Some. So among these thirty species of fungi on oaks, some of them are generalists, and they will also occur on pines or madrones, and some of them are very narrow specialists and only occur on oaks. And I think the same would be true for pines and madrones, but I haven't looked at that. So we have some generalists, probably worldwide generalists, and some much more local. And it's sort of to your advantage to be, um, either one has an advantage. So if you're a generalist and you don't happen to find uh, oak roots and there happens to be ponderosa pine, well, you just go with the pines, you know, and they go to synthesize more. And the seasonality of those trees is all a little bit different because these oaks are deciduous. Um, but if you're a specialist, let's see, what would be the advantage of being a specialist? Well, you know, you just get, you just don't have to mess around with those pines. You just get this one tree and it's all, all yours. And it, it seems like a good idea. I don't know. You can be either way. 
Anything else coming in? Barbara has a question. Yes. She'll repeat it. She'll repeat it. Oh, okay. I, I would like to go encourage Oak Trees to grow at my place, which has oak black and white on it all over the place. And um, people, I have heard people say that you cannot grow oaks unless you go to like an oak woodland and get the soil and bring it to that tree. And in other words, my trees that are growing in damaged soil or in the grassland, they need milk. Is that true? I think generally speaking, yes. I, I will I will show you a, a little exception to that, but uh, yes, grassland, grasses have mycorrhizal fungi, but they are not ectomycorrhizal fungi. They're those glomeromycota that I won't talk about because it takes too much time. But um, yes, so uh, there's a sort of a sense of, well, fungi are everywhere, there's spores everywhere, and that's sort of partly true and totally false. Um, it, people study how far the spores of a mushroom go. And the answer is about three feet. You know, could they go further? Yeah, but they don't seem to, I don't know. They just don't have, they have no, they, they depend on on um, wind at right close to the ground. That isn't your everyday wind. And um, they, they don't have any motor ability of their own. They're just dust, you know, so. Grasslands are not a good place for oaks. And okay, so, so we've got acorns and we wanna plant them in the winter so that they get their root down by spring so that they're not drying out when it's drying out, okay? So that's good. And so how do you get them? So by, by May and June, when you've got lateral roots developing, those are not at the surface. They're, they're a few inches below, maybe six, maybe 12, something like that. So how do you get the spores down there? And, and how do you, where, where did you get the spores and, and how did you store the spores? Um, I think it's really a challenge. I, I don't have an easy solution for that. I, I understand what they need and when they need it. And I don't quite know how to deliver that. So you can say, well, I'm going to buy the I'm going to buy the spores. Okay, and we did look at the spores from Mike Amaranthus and Grants Pass, and there were in in this ectomycorrhizal inoculum bag that we got. There were two kinds. You know, we did the DNA. We just forgot them up. We said, well, who's here? And there were two, and they were ectomycorrhizal. Well, two, huh? Okay. About 30 is the usual number, like more like a typical number, at least 10 at least 10 species. You need more than that. So will that do? Will that do for a start? You know, if I buy this and I put it on there in the fall, will the, will the spores wait? Okay, you guys, I'm gonna put you on there when I put when I plant my acorns, I'm gonna plant spores in it. Will they wait? I don't know, you know, that's that's tricky to figure out. It's tricky to discover that, to explore that phenomenon. Um, I think it's a real challenge. Okay, and if you say, well, let's dig up some soil. Okay, so when you're digging up the soil, what are you getting in the soil? Well, you're getting roots, which is a good thing. You're cutting them off from the tree, which is a bad thing. Um, you're getting some spores. Some of them might last a long time. Some of the spores of ectomycorrhizal fungi probably last a year, if not several years. Some of them last a much shorter, months. So. Uh, so when do I take that soil? Uh, do I do it? Um, do I do it with when I plant my acorns in November? I'm planting my acorns. Uh, should I dig up the the November soil? Well, the November soil is kind of pooped out. It's been all dry like it is now. You know, it's not going to be wet by November. Um, no, I could wait till spring. But then in spring, I've got my seedling. It's got a taproot. It's making these little delicate lateral roots. Oh well, how do I get that? stuff out of the soil onto it's just a challenge i don't have an easy answer what are the possible questions yes so related to that um someone in says if we buy containerized oak won't the fungi be in the soil from the nursery i've successfully planted lots of orange oaks that way uh depending on uh, partially yes we did a study uh, with uh, a group from uh, olympia forest service research group the Pacific Northwest Research Station up there. 
And they planted a lot of them. And we, we looked at the roots of their seedlings that they were gonna plant out. And there were mycorrhizal fungi on them, two species. So if you plant them out there, if you're planting them in grasslands and they're working, so maybe ask the chat person, uh, I'll ask the chat person, where, where did you plant them? Were you planting them near oaks or pines or madrones? Were you planting them out in grasslands? That would be a question. See if there's, see if an answer comes to that one. Yes. So, so my question, is, I'm also presumptuous enough to think that I can use some oaks on my property. And I do have a lot of colors in um, and I have a large pasture with a lot of white oaks, but I have some large areas where I'm using dark firs. So am I wasting my How far will that kind of web go? Okay. How far out does uh, how far out does the web go? I think I have a slide that will do that. And and this starts to tell you how we went about answering that question, basically. How do they get together? Where do they get together? Sorry, yes. I'm not hearing the question in the mic. So Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So we want to know how far out from a tree you could expect to find oak roots that would inoculate seedlings. I think that's a good question. And we did ask that question. So we selected trees at the edge of oak stands, both near shrubs and grasslands. So, okay. We're at Weststone Savannah and there is a stand of oaks but it's not completely covered. And there's a lot of chaparral type veg there, a lot of ceanothus, a lot of buckbrush. And in some places there's grassland. It's pretty degraded, it's cheat grass, it's not very fun. But so you can find places where the oaks, the edge of an oak savanna meets chaparral, buckbrush, or where it meets grasslands. So we did that. And we set transects out, we, we drew lines out, 45 meters, so that would be like 130 feet. And along there at intervals, we would plant acorns. So this is November, maybe an, uh, a sunny November day. We go out there and we mark off these transects and we put little pin flags where we're gonna plant our oaks and somebody goes out there and makes a little scratch in the soil. And I pick up the oaks, the acorns under the tree and we walk them out there. No taking them back to the refrigerator, no cleaning them off with Bleach, I just took them out there. And what was really cool was the acorns are warm. It's like picking up eggs from a hen. It's just too cool. Anyway, it's a beautiful day. We did that and we planted these out there at intervals and then covered them up. And I was so concerned that they would be eaten by deer. I was horrified, I was terrified that we put these cages around some of them, not all. Okay, later, Later, as time passes, come spring, come June, we excavated selected seedlings to look for their mycorrhizal fungi. And we took soil cores out there to see whether there were roots out at those distances as well. And identified the, the fungi uh, by DNA methods. Okay, so do you have the picture? We wanna know how far out they go. And I had these students who, they just started working for me and they were going out and taking these biopsies, these soil cores. And they weren't finding anything and they thought they were failures because they weren't finding anything. And I said, well, it's not your fault. The roots don't go out there. They really recovered, the students recovered. Them. That was good. Okay, and here's what we found. Well, let's do this. So this is percent germination. Do the acorns have to be close to the trees to germinate? Will the acorns germinate in grasslands? Well, what you see is that in grasslands, we've got 10% and clear out here at, at 35 meters, you know, a hundred feet out there. There's some germination. It's not much lower than over here. This is like this is ten percent germination. That's seven. That's probably not different. So it means that the acorn itself doesn't need any special deal to germinate. If you garden near an oak tree, you are familiar with this phenomenon. They'll germinate in the gutter if you don't clean them. That sort of thing. Um, in shrublands, the germination rate was a little higher, like fifteen percent, and again the acorns germinate out in the shrublands. So acorns are fine. They can germinate just about anywhere, 
probably this is a water function that it was a little drier in the grasslands. We didn't measure that. So they germinate well in shrublands and they will germinate in grasslands. So that's, that's just sort of preliminary. Okay, and then, come on, let's see here. Well, we seem to have locked up. We'd like to maybe, oh, there we go. Okay, let's see. Okay, I think, okay, that's the one we were at? Yep. Here we go, thank you. Yeah, I got an R, Rachel. Okay, and do they grow up to be saplings? And saplings, I'm really talking about trees that are 15 feet high. Somebody who's lived for a while, I, they're sort of, I think of them as sort of teenagers, you know. They're not seedlings. Seedlings are anywhere. Seedlings, the, the fact that an acorn germinates doesn't tell you what's gonna happen to it. But these trees are happening. And as we, so this was another measurement we went out at these distances, and we counted, uh, this says saplings uh, per 80 meters squared. So we, we made a circle out there, we counted the number of trees in it, moving away from the edge of the savanna. So right near the savanna edge, there's a lot of, there's a lo a lot of saplings. And as you go out, it kind of wanders off. It becomes sort of a chancy thing. But clear out at 30, at, this is 45 meters out, there are still saplings out there. There are trees as big as this that have some real potential to grow into a whole oak tree, but only in the shrublands and not in the grasslands. So the grasslands, it's just, they just don't appear out there randomly. And that's what we found at Whetstone anyway. So sapling survival declines away from mature trees, but it's not zero. All right, so we're, gonna, we're thinking now that there's something about shrublands that promotes and supports the growth of acorn seedlings, oak seedlings into trees. Okay, uh, so, so this way. Okay, so we wondered whether rodents were carrying the fungi out there. And the thing about the rodents is they make these little tunnels in the upper layers of soil. So aren't they cute? Um, Paramiscus is a, a white-footed mouse, and the Rhytherodonimus is called a harvest mouse, and this is a vole. So we made this rather elaborate scheme, and we um, set out Sherman live traps. We have a, had a mammologist in the department who helped me. We fed them something like flavored instant oatmeal, and uh, we would open the traps in the afternoon, the traps would be open all night. And then you had to go out there in the morning before it got too hot and, and check the, clear the traps. So what we would do uh, to clear the traps, we would pick up the trap. See, I think this is the trap, yes? Right, I'm holding the trap. And um, uh, Corey is picking out little fecal pellets and David is cheering them on. We dumped, the, we dumped the contents into a bucket and the little animals would run around in the bucket and we would identify them and let them go. It, it was a live trap and we didn't need to, there was no reason to kill them. And you may know that mice poop really spontaneously, I think I would call it. So there was no trouble getting fecal pellets from these. Um, and that's what we did. And then we examined those microscopically to look for spores. So we were looking for something, this is a compound microscope image of a tuber spore and they're recognizable as such. So we, we again set those traps out at the same distances that we had measured the saplings, that we had measured the plant of the acorns uh, to see if rodents were carrying the truffle spores out there or any other spores for that matter. And the answer was, Basically, this is the answer that says, yes, do the rodents in the shrublands defecate spores? So this is the, the percentage of fecal pellets that contain spores. That's pretty good, you know? Every, virtually every fecal pellet contains spores. Way out there at 45 meters. And where we, did we capture rodents out there? Yes, actually we captured a lot of them in the, in the shrublands 
and a very few in the grasslands. So we had these traps set out in shrublands and grasslands and very few rodents came to the traps in grasslands, lots of them in shrublands. For this, for this study, that was a, a relatively large number. Um, so one day a student came to me and she said, I've got these things under the microscope and there's all these circle, all these circles is packed in there. And I went and took a look at it. And then I thought for a while and looked at some books on my shelves and it was all Ceanothus pollen. So I actually know, wait, this is seriously TMI. Uh, it's like, I know what that rodent did. It ate a truffle under the oak tree. It went out there, climbed up to see and this and ate the flowers. You know, didn't really need to know that, but that's what it did. So the rodents are part of this dispersal system. I don't know how much of their time is spent running through tunnels or, or running over the surface. I didn't go out to Weststone Savannah at night and watch for mice. I mean, I guess you could, but it seems like a bit of a loss leader. There's lots of tunneling. Anytime we would dig in the soil, there would be little cavities here and there. So there's, there's a whole other story about the shape of the tunnels of all these animals, and I don't know what that story is. But yes, the rodents do eat the truffle spores. The truffles are more under the trees, and they take them out there, and they poop. This is not exactly surprising. Okay, so do the seedlings out there get mycorrhizas? This is, a, I'm gonna, I need to work on this graph. But anyway, seedlings with mycorrhizas clearly, so stick to the green triangles. Clearly, most of the seedlings who get the mycorrhizal fungi are near a tree. And this would be probably 10, 10 meters. And it declines as they go out there. But we did some second year seedlings. We didn't take them all out the first year. And we found that out at some distance, the two second year seedlings got truffle mycorrhizal fungi. There's the uh, geopera and tuber to the genera. So this is a minuscule data set. It's a hard one data set, but it's not very big. But if, if, a, if a sapling out there a two-year-old, I mean, see, it's like this. It's not very big. Little, little oak seedling has tuber mycorrhiza on its roots. Somebody took it out there and pooped it and crawled around underground. And I could make up a story, but so can you. So there's a whole level of ecological dispersal that has to do with small mammals. So if you want the seedlings to get mycorrhizal fungi, it would help if you could encourage the mice and the voles. We, we wanted to test pocket gophers, but pocket gophers have uh, higher standards and they do not come into live traps, not. Uh, so we had to terminate a few, we had some kill traps and we, we had three pocket gophers. I mean, these data sets are small, okay? And they were in the freezer for a while. Um, and one summer I said to a student, David, how would you like to cut open the guts of these gophers and look for spores? And she said, oh yes, you know, that's the kind of students I had. Anyway, um, and there were spores in the pocket gophers. So pocket gophers as well. And they're making tunnels down there and you don't know where those tunnels go but they do. Okay, yes. Do ground squirrels? Do ground squirrels. We, did not, uh, we did not kill any ground squirrels and no ground squirrels came into the live traps. I think, yeah, in the day. Yeah, um, they didn't come in. And certainly at Whetstone, there are ground squirrels. They tend to be closer to the road and in the grasslands rather than the shrublands. I'm just speaking from Whetstone. There were certainly ground squirrels there. Well, just kill them and take a look at the guts. And that, I mean, that's how you tell. You don't even have to do DNA. You can look at them microscopically. It's a, we didn't look. And uh, yeah, okay. So 
So here are some conclusions at this point. Um, the seedlings must connect with fungi when the lateral roots appear in the spring. That's when the mycorrhizal formation occurs. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi are abundant near trees. That if you look at, how many of you have ever seen a truffle in, in the ground? Not at Louis at the grower's marker. <laughs> Not at the guy in Eugene, Charlie. Um, they're there, you know, we would go out to what's, I went out one, one Mother's Day at Whetstone Savannah and I think I collected 30 truffles. I mean, they're small. They're not the famous ones. They're not the edibles, but- Are they associated with roots? Yes, okay. yes. So they develop. They do. I think- um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, are, they, are truffles associated with roots? Yes, I don't think I've been clear about this. Nearly all truffles, almost all truffles, maybe 98% are mycorrhizal. So you don't get, you can't grow truffles without growing the host tree. That's what Charlie the fever sells out of Eugene um, for hazelnuts and for oaks. Um, and they have developed ways of inoculating them so that they can be sold as inoculated seedlings. And I don't know exactly how they do it. Um, yeah, so definitely truffles are mycorrhizal. That's why they grow under oaks in Italy. That's why they grow under oaks in Germany. That's why they grow under oaks in the Willamette Valley in Southern British Columbia. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult. And it's not that truffles are rare. It's that they're hidden. And um, we didn't have any, I, we haven't used any truffle dogs. We, we just went out there and looked for truffles ourselves. We got better at it. We got pretty good at it. I, I can tell students, um, look, this is what I do. This is how I scrape the ground. This is what they look like. Go find them. And they would. I mean, that's what somebody told us at one November. Yeah, you have to go out there in the spring and look for truffles. We never seen a truffle. We didn't know what they were. And three of us went out there. We started digging around on the, in, in the loose soil under the oaks. Uh, there were spring flowering bulbs. There were pupae. There were agates. And there was something else that looked like a small potato. That's why they call it tuber. And we found them, you know, without knowing, without being shown by anybody. So th these are findable out there. It's pretty fun to do. Okay. Most of the most of the seedling roots get their mycorrhizal fungi from the parent tree. Okay, let's talk specifically about how far out they go. The roots that we cored, I think it's several slides back, went out about another half diameter of the canopy. So if the canopy is 20 feet across, even if it's a little uneven, another half of that, there would still be roots out there. Beyond that, very sparse. So if you have, if you want your oak savanna to expand and you can and you can get acorns, you want to move some acorns out anywhere from the drip line out about another half canopy. We, I mean, I can give this to you in meters, but it, it's not relevant. It's it's a, what fraction of the tree that you have that, that it goes out. Uh, people who work on pines say that the roots go way out there. And I have no personal experience with that. I would believe them when they say that. And they, person after person said, you know, I'll bet those roots go way out there. And that's why we went out there and did all, did all those cores with nothing in it, was to say that we could answer the question, no. It's helpful to do that. So in terms of, in terms of planting, you're really safe out there at the canopy edge. If, you're, if your seedlings are coming up under the canopy, that's another problem because then the shade and the competition from the parent tree is too great. So if you can get them out at the edge and a little bit further, you're golden. You don't have to do anything. Actually, you don't have to do anything at all. We'll come to that. Okay. And, and I think we must consider that small mammals are part of the dispersal. These animals are everywhere. These animals that I showed you are nocturnal. I personally never saw one in the day when I was out there, but they're there. And 
we're talking about a mycorrhizal community for a, a stand of mature oaks that's large and complex. And, and so if you plant something with two species on it, is that enough to get it into a, uh, a, a large enough root zone that it can find somebody else or some rodent comes out there with something or some spore blows out there? We, we didn't study that. We don't, we don't really know that. Okay, so this is sort of my advice. Like, right? okay, we don't know how to inoculate the oak seedlings in the grasslands. And it's the seasonality and the depth that just confound me. Okay. And some people have asked about commercial fertilizers. The general finding um, is uh, by mycorrhizal people is that fertilizers decrease the fraction of roots that are mycorrhizal. So if you think of it as the mycorrhizas are the way they get nitrogen, just think nitrogen for a minute. If I apply nitrogen, that has a, a depressive effect on mycorrhizal formation. So it's certain that all of those oaks that you can go out there and look at don't get fertilized. They don't get anything added manually by, by people. They may get nitrogen from cars and stuff like that, but they don't, nobody's fertilizing them. They're doing just fine, thank you. Okay, but we didn't study that. All right, and I talked a little bit about this. Oh, so this was a question that came up too. There's been some attempt to introduce truffle spores into oak stands. Some of the people in Southern British Columbia are working on this. And uh, I have said to them over and over, you have to do the before and after to see what the effect is. And they don't listen to me. So we do not know if you add truffle spores, say, say you wanted, like we didn't find any Oregon white truffles, Oregon black truffles, any of the edible commercial ones, here. They're further north, they're in the Willamette Valley, they definitely find them, find them in the Cascades, but not here, not in our bathtub ring Gariana stuff. Okay, um, so well, let's see, where was I going with that? Some people want to inoculate Oregon white oaks, Corcus Gariana, which are called Gary Oaks in Canada, with a, an edible truffle because there's a market for that. It's huge, it's like gold, you know? Um, and so they just wanna go out there, throw the spores on and see if they get truffles. Fair enough, that, that, is, that is a way to find that out. But to find out what effect that has on the native community, they're not looking at. It could be looked at, it's an expensive, extensive project, but it's doable. Okay, so my real advice, here's my real advice. You wanna protect your oak tree, back away, don't mow, don't rake, don't water, don't fertilize, don't prove, and don't chain, chainsaw, leave it alone. And now we understand that we're talking about surface roots here. We're talking about roots in this area that are subject to, that would, would, would get hit by any of these. And we're talking about small mammals. Um, yeah, the best story I ever heard was from a uh, talk on Sudden Oak Death by Dave Rizzo, UC Davis. He was the plant pathologist when Sudden Oak Death hit the, came out of the market and onto the trees. And he said, well, when I started my project, it looked like this. It was a beautiful oak savanna overlooking the valley. And I came back six months later and we all leaned forward with our mouths open. And he said, and it was a vineyard. It, wasn't, it was sudden. It was oak death, but you can't blame fight, top thrower or more for that one. So the less you do, the, the more certain you are that you're doing something good. And the, the leaves that are there decompose right there and get recycled into the tree. I mean, they, they have to, that, they disappear. I was amazed. I thought maybe they'd last forever. I mean, there are some plants who have leaves so leathery, they just about never break down. That's not true for Oregon white oaks. It's probably not true for for very many oaks. Um, and uh, th there is this one exception and that is overtopping other trees, particularly Douglas fir, it's the only one I know about. So there's this, there was this group that I talked about in uh, the PNW research station who wanted to see what would happen if they removed 
Douglas fir. So it, in, uh, and it was done on Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis is um, south of Seattle. It's a uh, bath suburb Corcus Gariana. And it's a huge acreage, this base. And they even have their own foresters. So the Forest Service foresters and the Lewis, Fort Lewis foresters worked together and they picked out plots where the oaks were really skinny and just, you know, that kind of shape, reaching for the sky, trying to get them. Right? And the, the Douglas fir was overtopping them. So the Fort Lewis foresters went in and very carefully cut out the Douglas fir. And you know, what'd you think? All the oh, oaks are gonna fall down. That's what I thought. I mean, I thought a lot of wrong things. Um, no, the oaks thought that was great. And all over the branches, new, right from under the bark, new branches appeared. It was, it was fabulous. It was incredible. So if you really got a situation where your oaks are being overtopped by Douglas fir, which climate change might take care of not to worry, um, you can cut out trees. You can cut out anything that's shading them. We thought that, I mean, if they, so who came first, the oak or the Douglas fir? Well, first of all, it doesn't matter. What if they came at the same time and the oak went like this and the Douglas fir went like that? That would be it. Anyway, you get these situations where it's a little bit wetter and the Douglas fir overtops the oaks. And removing them really made a huge difference in that. What about removing other stuff? Um, you know, I don't know enough about it to argue. Should you remove poison oak at your peril? Um, should you remove blackberries? You gotta think that one through. Um, and what else could you remove? Um, what else would you like to remove? Should you pull out the grasses? Probably not. You know, it starts to get a lot of shade, gets a lot of oak leaves on it. The cheat grass isn't happy there. The yellow star thistle, I don't think it is, is surrounding it. Yes. Okay, uh, are there any effects of, of fire on this cycle, longitudinal effects? Um, yeah, yes, um, to the extent that fire in, has come through white oak stands. And we looked at one of the stands um, on the Illinois River Road after the Biscuit Fire. And that's an area where there's a lot of scrub oaks this high, um, but Corcus Gariana, white oaks. And we walked in there like the next year and it's still full of charred sticks poking you. You know, you can tell it's burned. You can tell exactly where it's burned. And right at the crown, right down at the base where all these branches would come off, there's about a foot and a half of the hottest green shoots you've ever seen. And it's coming right back. And I was down at one of those root bases where the trees came together, I was looking for truffles and I was scuffling around and a lot of the litter had burned. So it wasn't hard. And underneath that burned shrub was a root crown like this. It was like a foot in diameter. That's the root collar where the shoots come up and the roots go down, you know, that sort of place. And I thought, my God, this is old growth white oak. It's, it's been here for hundreds of years. So I think part of the answer is if the oak is really seriously burned, like these were charred, that it comes back from the roots. Um, if it's a little bit burned, the rest of it will continue to grow. I think they have remarkable resilience. You know, the fire doesn't, the heat of the fire doesn't go very deep unless there's really a big log burning there for days, weeks, months, years. Um, it only goes down a couple of inches. The heat really is, is pretty shallow. So I, I think that, um, and the other thing is, probably every oak stand has burned. Okay, need to pass a little bit more time. We did a subsequent study of truffles in a lot of places, looked at a lot of them, and I thought, you know what we ought to do is we ought to check off which of these sites has charcoal in it. Answer, 
all. You know, there was always charred wood in there. So there's been so much fire here that these are basically part of a fire adapted community. That's a way of dodging the question, but they, um, the problem with longitudinal studies in oaks is that you just don't live long enough. You know, we just like 75 years. And as I told some of my students, you know, you might still be around 75 years from now, but you might be interested in something else. I mean, it's hard to stay focused that long. Um, <laughs> you, you understand that problem. So I think I have looked at some of the sites um, after the Klamathon fire, the one that burned through Hornbrook and up towards uh, past Iron Gate. Um, I went up there and there, there was definitely regrowth of oaks. It'll, it'll be back. I think it's, it's hard to completely take out an oak stand. It may be hard to get an oak stand. It may be hard to make one, but it's hard to get rid of it too without just cutting and cutting. Yeah, really grow. So this is sort of the, the take home lesson. Let's see what I can do. So you have these trees, this is a lot of grassland, and they have these acorns and they germinate. And a few of them get to be like that. We, we once fabricated a, some like, guess how many acorns are coming and how many germinate and how long will this take? And if they do this for 400 years, we figure it's about one in a million. One in a million acorns makes another tree and that's enough because there's, these trees are long lived. Anyway, and this tree has on it mycorrhizal fungi. These are the, this is a mycorrhiza, not just a fungus. And these fungi produce fruiting bodies. This is a tuber, um, a truffle in the genus tuber that gets eaten by the cutest vole ever and pooped <laughs> and onto the roots of the saplings and the seedlings. So that's basically the life cycle. And, and to, get from, from, to get from here to here and around back to a big tree, that takes a long time. And that those, those kind of longitudinal studies are seriously lacking. Okay, so I provide for you a, um, a list of references. This will be on, you are saving this. So you can look at the um, PowerPoint and see that it's not um, easy literature. Probably there was one. Oh, Northwest Science is a pretty. That's a pretty good one. It's pretty easy to read, and um, a lot of this was paid for by. Uh, the National Science Foundation, we had about 10 years worth of money for that. Uh, the Interagency Special Status and Sensitive Species Program um, supported our truffle work to, to keep finding rare species of, of uh, truffles. And there were lots of students, uh, undergraduates, two, three master students, two lab techs, two citizen scientists, and six co-PIs. It was, it was the best of times. Okay, we can go to any other questions now. There are, so first of all, I wanted to just check this is another mic, folks in the Zoom, can you hear this mic better? Maybe you can drop that in the chat. Did you know I was gonna say that I've read that Native Americans burned the oak uh, grasslands in their communities for acorn production like every two years. So aside from whatever was happening naturally, a lot, there's been a lot of fire in the oaks for yeah. sure. Um, there's a good recording of Frank Lake on the uh, Sissy chapter of the Native Plant Society. And I'll try to put that into the chat here on our YouTube chapter. And he has a nice talk about a piece of fire with oats for acorn production. He's, he's a, a PhD U.S. Forest Service uh, biologist and also does a lot with fire and, um, and is also a member of the tribe and I think a couple of other tribes. Um, I'm looking at my colleague from the in a plant society over there. I heard that day as well. Um, so there's that, and then we have some questions in the chat. Is it is Zoom? Are you hearing this? I'm guessing you're not hearing this. Let's, let me ask. Um, uh, Zoom people, are you hearing the questions that Rachel is asking? If so, send a sign. So there are a couple questions in the chat. Then. Like some do those. Okay. Okay. 
Um, let's see here. Oh, not very well through this. So there was a, a lot of wondering about someone saying that she's planted um, oaks far away. That same person, I've planted container oaks near oaks sometimes and sometimes not, such as in a warmer pasture and she's in the North Valley. So she was saying solid, she's had oaks away in the dental cave, but one that she purchased from the nursery and was wondering if that was inoculated like the dirt thing. Um, I, I don't know, it, it's, it may be. There are some fungi that, oh, sorry, the question is. I planted container oaks near oaks sometimes and sometimes not, such as in a former pasture in the North Valley. But the question is, do container oaks that you buy have fungi? And, and the answer is, I, I don't really know, some may. And there are some fungi that are sort of greenhouse aficionados. Again, it's in the one to two species category and they can get on, on the roots of uh, greenhouse grown oak seedlings. And, and what we don't know is if, if that's enough to, to really get yourself 75 years of oak growth out of that. And, and I don't know. I mean, you could look at them. We probably should have a lesson in looking here sometime um, and see whether there are mycorrhizal fungi. If you had a dissecting scope, you could certainly do it. Um, and then why no watering of solitary oaks? Why no watering of solitary oaks? Well, we know that if we water them, the surface roots increase and then you can't stop. You have to keep watering. You just, like your cat, you know, you have to keep watering it. And you can never stop. You, and, and it gets dry and you forget or water goes off or water costs too much or whatever. So you create a situation where the tree likes that, but it's not a permanent solution. If you let all of those oaks in the hillside that I saw on my way here from Ashland, uh, off the uh, east side of I-5, the northeast side. Nobody's watering them. They are green. They're not looking tired. They're not looking crinkle up. Um, so it's clear that there are sources of water that do it. And yes, you can help, but then, you know, you have to decide what you're in it for. <laughs> and if you're watering it, to water at the drip line. If you've got a seedling, it probably doesn't matter where you water. But if you have a tree and you want to water it, the drip line is the place. That would be the place where the water first goes as it starts to rain here. Um, what are the det detrimental effects of disturbing the area under oaks, watering, planting, etc.? Is there any distance away from the trunk that is safe? I'm wondering about uh -huh. landscaping around mature oaks in yeah. smaller yards. Yes, um, this is a common question. How far? If I, if I say back off, how far do you have to back off? Well, I think if you backed off past the drip line, maybe that half diameter again. So it's a 20 foot diameter tree, tree diameter canopy. You give it a few more feet past the drip line, then you can start planting roses. Okay, and then there was one back here too that I missed that said, did you test to know if mature trees top and support the saplings? Did, did I test to see whether mature trees talk to and support saplings? Did I test that? Well, yes, I did. These are seedlings. I think I have one on saplings as well. This one has the percent of seedlings with mycorrhizas. And this is the distance from the trunk, distance from the bowl of the tree. And the green triangles are the seedlings and, and close in, there's a lot of mycorrhizal ones. Now we, we talked about saplings, let's see. Um, let's see. Yeah, that was the seeds. This is the one, the question, where are the saplings? Plenty of them are close to the tree, but this is, this is like five meters. So that would be 15 feet. That's probably just past the canopy edge, depending on how big the tree was at the time. So 
saplings do like to grow up near trees. I mean, if you drive down the road and you look, that's where they are. A lot of the times you see, see the saplings right at the edge. Now, maybe that's because that's where the road is and that's where I'm riding and that's not where, you know, I'm not looking elsewhere. But I think this, the, I think that a savanna can grow and move at the rate at which hyphae grow, which is slow, but not zero. So that's the creep, you know? I would put a lot of money on oaks for a uh, response to climate change. Quercus gariana grows from uh, a, an altitude, an elevation of three feet, one meter in the Gulf Islands between Vancouver Island and British Columbia. Sea surf right here, roots right there, to about 3,500 feet in Crater Lake National Park. We've seen those, we've been up there, they're sparse. This is nowhere near the rim, it's not about the lake. Uh, but to the west side of the lake, down past the pumice fields, down into the slopes, there are Oregon white oaks. So what a huge range. And in terms of latitudinal dispersal, the northernmost ones grow in very southern BC, um, Vancouver Island for sure, Gulf Islands for sure, up the Fraser River Canyon, a ways. And they look good. I've been up there. I looked at them. And they grow as far south as the transverse ranges around the town of Lancaster, which is just north of Pasadena. We're talking Southern California here. And I've seen those. Well, they look great too. So this is a plant that can move up slope. It can move that way. And I don't, they're planting, there's all this moaning and groaning about dead dug firs in the National Watershed. I'm not a big Doug for a fan, you've probably figured that out. Um, and yes, uh, they're, so they're suffering water stress and they're thinking to do it more with black oaks and I don't understand that at all. I don't know why they don't need white oaks, but whatever, oaks is good. Yes? Have there been studies on black oak? Have there been studies on black oak? I don't know of anything as thorough as what we have done. Um, have we done any? Yes, they do. They have ectomycorrhizae. All of the oak species that anybody has looked at anywhere in the known universe have mycorrhizal fungi on their root tips. It's, isn't that something? <laughs> they really get around. How about tan oak? How about tan oak? Yes, tan oak also is ectomycorrhizal. And uh, it's a very similar situation. And that has been studied. This quite a, yeah. Yes. Yes, does the taproot, the taproot of seedlings has no mycorrhizal connections, um, associations. Does that happen later? Um, well, I haven't looked. Okay, B. But as the roots age, they become very woody and they get a kind of bark on them. And that won't allow for mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi want the root tips where it's the epidermis is thin, there's no woody stuff on it. So anytime you see a woody root coming, you know, that's not mycorrhizal. That's not where the action is. Yes. How do you come back to this? Um, so, so tan oaks are really more and more than California, correct? Yes, there's some in or Southern Oregon. Okay, but would there be a danger in trying to cultivate them up there because of their connection to sudden death? Well, I would consider that. It's like, why would you plant something that might get sudden oak death? <laughs> <They're getting laughs> that seems like a loss leader. Yeah. I think that's what's dying. Yeah. I think black oak is a little bit susceptible, but it's the tan oak. Yeah. The, a lot. Tan oaks. I, I certainly wouldn't plant a tan oak. It, okay, what about tan oaks? Would you plant tan oaks because um, in, in interior Southern Oregon? And they definitely are mycorrhizal. They definitely get sudden oak death. I would not plant them here on a bed under any circumstances because why would you do that? Uh, you'd have to be in love with tan oaks. There are some, I think you get some 
into um, Josephine County interior a little bit, and that might be a possibility. But the, the sudden oak death syndrome is well studied here, and that wouldn't be my choice of trees. And black oak gets it as well, as does coast live oak, uh, uh, Quaker sagrifolia. That's, that's the one that's really suffering. Yeah, I don't know all species. I think it's amazing. I mean, there are these resistance genes. There's, there's a lot of, this is not my field at all. This is plant pathology, but there's a lot of knowledge of genes for resistance to fungi and bacterial diseases in many plants. Yeah, that's got a couple more questions here in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, so one back from the beginning was mycorrhizal inoculants are commercially available and somewhat popular in nursery production. How are they produced and does this not constitute cultivation? Uh, how, um, mycorrhizal inoculum uh, is commercially available. I think it's kind of just trendy. Um, and you read the label and you don't know. And, you know, every now and then some mycorrhizal person will have a look at, you know, will look, grind them up and take the DNA out and see what's really in there. And it's usually some of what's on the label is in there, but like tomatoes. So tomatoes are not ectomycorrhizal. They're mycorrhizal with these vesicular or vascular mycorrhizas, which are not mushrooms or cup fungi. Um, most plants are mycorrhizal with something. But, but what you're putting on there, it's not controlled. I mean, there's no standard for what the label says to be in there. It's like all the other stuff you get like that that doesn't have a standard. So they can be partially true. So you could collect spores from various organisms and package them up and sell them. Maybe just by stock in the company. But um, I'm going to stop to share something funny is happening here. Okay. And then there are a couple more okay. questions. That like. Did I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't waste my money, but maybe it works sometimes, in which case, you know, you plant a lot of things in the garden and some years are better than others and you never really know why and nobody's looking at the roots and it's a lot of expense and time and microscope effort and... And then, so then someone also asked um, a back to the watering question. So if mature oaks are on the edge of an irrigated space, it won't actually hurt them. If, if mature oaks are on the edge of an irrigated space, it won't actually hurt them. I would say probably not. That I've sufficiently wishy-washy. I've heard people say that they, you can kill oaks. You know, you plant your house, you plant your house. <laughs> you have a yard, you landscape your yard yeah. and you start watering and, and then the trees. I think it's a it's a risk, um, but if you know every situation is a little bit different. Like how far down is it to the water table, and what else is there? How much other sidewalk and street stuff is there? Um, I think you have to repeat the question. Really. Sorry. Okay. If you uh, how close to a tree can you irrigate? If you're irrigating for something else, will you damage the oak tree? Uh, the answer is it depends uh, how much, how close, uh, the, the shape of the land, whether you're in a hollow. Yeah, you know, at Whetstone, there are these vernal pools. You may know this, you may have been there uh, with uh, fairy shrimp in them and the vernal pools are just filling in the spring. If it's a wet spring, they don't fill every year. And we have cored vernal pools and there's just no roots underneath the pools. Well, the pools are pools because there must be a hard pan underneath them, otherwise the water would soak in and figure this out. Um, but some of the trees are, are like, there are pools really close to the trees and they seem to have separated the territory in ways that are not visible. And so if there's a hard pan, which there has to be to have vernal pools, and there are these oaks which have to get through the hard pan, you know, how does that work? I don't know. I haven't been there. I haven't been down there. There must be cracks. Anything else from the room? Well, I just think that they really do well by themselves. And that that's the, 
that's the remarkable thing about them. They're just phenomenally good. And that as the climate gets warmer, as we have stranger weather and dry and fires, I just see those oaks marching right up the Cascades and heading into interior BC. They do live across the Cascades. There are some on the on points into Klamath Lake. There are some on the east side of Mount Hood, there's some in the Yakima Valley. So they're they're getting around. I don't think they're gonna take over elsewhere, but as as a plant that can have some move, can move somewhat. They're good. Yes. Is sudden oak death caused by drought? Is sudden oak death caused by drought? No, it's caused by a microorganism. Um, it's a Phytophthora. It's this. It's the same genus as the Port Orford cedar root rot. It's and it's an it's an organism that came in on uh, commercial plants, and it's just spread through. It, it's airborne, it has spores, it has little swimming things. Um, when Port Orford cedar, which gets the same genus, uh, it, the stuff travels down streams. Uh, the coast, I mean, the coast live oak gets it, that's wet. So I don't, to my knowledge, drought is not a major factor, it's a disease. And I don't think it's getting worse because it's getting drier. I think it's getting worse because it was brought in and the, the causal organism is spreading. It is carried in droplets. So it might be more of a risk. I can't remember. I don't think I've seen a recent thing, but Ellen Goldine has given some good talks about sure. it, but kind of it's, you know, it has different host species that will carry it around and the droplets facility. Right. It's so carried on, um, Right? Rhododendrons, I think. Oh, um, okay, so. Maybe madrones. I'm not sure. Yeah, there are other go-to people for this, but it's around. I mean, maybe drought's a good thing. If it's yeah. carried by water droplets, let's dry it out. It's just, just a cut above no idea. <laughs> All right, I think maybe we've done it. Thank you very much. So I'm wondering if some of those same species have alternative hosts in shrublands so that they're already present in like a rise of the uh, Certainly the grassland and the herbaceous animal stuff, the herbaceous perennial stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.